Hello and welcome to Bye Bitches. I'm your host, Melinda Clark here with my lovable co-host and daughter, CG Marriage, Catherine Grace Marriage, um, or Catherine the Great, sorry, honey. Uh, you guys might know me from a show called The OC and my recent podcast with Rachel Bilson. It was called Welcome to the OC Bitches, where at the end of each ep, I signed off with Bye Bitches. But you know what? It turns out I didn't want to say bye. So I really wanted to continue the conversations, but how to do that? Well, let me tell you. With this new podcast, inspired by our last rewatch, this Mindy Mouth, as my sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Ball, used to call me, and CG, we're re-watching more iconic movies and TV and talking to the very stars in them. There is more. We have also created a community over on Patreon called Buy Bitches, that includes even more content from this podcast and answers to your questions. We also have Welcome to the OC Bitches archival content, Discord, and live events with my mother, Melinda Clark, and Rachel. This is a community for all of you that have supported them on their old podcasts and didn't want Welcome to the OC Bitches to end. I hope you all join our community and continue the journey with us as we talk about more of the most iconic movies, TV, and people we love that have had an impact on us and our culture today. Let's get started. Hi, CG. Hi, honey. Hi, from Chicago. Yes. How are you, mom? I'm good. I'm good. We're actually pretty cloudy here at the beach, but how's the weather in Chicago? Oh, you know, it's bad as usual, but that's why they call it the Windy City. But enough about us. We just did this great interview with Tate Donovan, and we are very excited for everyone to hear it. Yes, it was long, it was epic, and you actually learned quite a bit, didn't you? Mm -hmm. So anyway, since it is long and he's one of my favorite people and wonderful storytellers, let's just get right into it. Thanks for being here, everyone. So we are so excited to welcome our first guest. He played the infamous Jimmy Cooper from the OC, and he contributed so much to Welcome to the OC Bitches podcast. But my friend Tate has such a long and vast resume that I wanted to continue the conversation. So please welcome Mr. Tate Donovan. Hi, Tate. Oh my God, I'm so psyched to be here. (laughs) Thank you so much. Talk about me and my vast career. Well, seriously, I mean... That's a good word for it. You've been doing this for a while. (laughs) Yeah, I have been doing it for a long time. These movies came out before I was born, so... I know, my gosh. I'm trying to think, you know, like, I feel as like the last time I saw you was like at an OC watch party or something like that, CG, and you were like four. I think Mm. I might have seen you later at your play in New York. Oh, Right, yes. But I have no idea how old I was. You were 11. I was 11. (laughs) (laughs) That's actually very funny. That was a while ago, too. That's a funny story. So I was in Toronto and CG came to visit me because she was living in LA and I was flying back and forth, but I just wanted to take her. To, like to to New York to do something fun, but she was at the age where all she wanted to do was go to the M and M store in Times Square, and you happened to be doing a play with Francis McDormand, right? Yeah, Called like Good super, People. like super inappropriate or not inappropriate, but just boring to an eleven year old. You know? I don't she remember was, it at all. Yeah, so yeah. Well, that's because you probably were looking at you know you're playing with your hair or looking Something at like did you that. have a phone at that point no the kids didn't have phones nope. back then she Probably was pretty not. good we had pretty good house seats down close and she was on the aisle and she actually paid attention but she was dragging me afterwards to go to the we, we went to the m&m store <laughs> at least a dozen times just in a couple days that's all she wanted to go to. <laughs> uh, but look at her now. She's 23. And wow. I love the idea of doing this podcast and continuing rewatching iconic things and talking to the people that we talked to on the OC who uh, who were in some of those iconic films and introducing them to CG because she's a, you know, she's going to Second City now in Chicago. Nice. Talk about iconic. That must be amazing. I mean, 
I, I love going there just to see all the comedians, all the actors that came out of there. It's mm-hmm. crazy. They have What's a that huge... like? How, how are the, you taking classes there? What are you, what are you doing? I'm taking improv and acting classes. I just finished level two of improv and I'm starting level three on Monday where I have, I will have a show at the end of it. Oh, um, that's exciting. Yeah. So this is, I always like my whole life. I was like, no, I don't want to act like I don't want to get into that business. Like I've seen what yeah. it does to mom. And then I, <laughs> <laughs> and then I graduated college and I realized, you know, I don't have a passion as much for what I studied. And I was like, you know what? Let's try it out. Let's go crazy. Yeah. yeah you're in Chicago. Why not? Why not go for yeah. it? It must be a lot of fun. I mean, it seems like a lot of fun. Is it as much fun as I'm imagining? Yes. It's also just like I am doing it to learn, but it's so fun. Like I have a nine to five job now. And on Monday nights after I get to go for three hours and just like mess around with some people and play improv games. And it's really, really fun. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine. Yeah. I think I might do that. Actually, Uh, I might sign up for improv one. (laughs) <laughs> I recommend you know, you know, just to get the juices flowing again. You know? I've been telling her that is probably one of the things that I think it's it's one of the bravest things that actors can do, but it's also so fundamental and so imperative to be a good actor because there's the rule is the number one rule is you can't say no and you have to go with what the other person's doing and you have to learn yeah. how to listen and yeah. I think that some of our best actors and stars came from that really Steve Carell was there that's how he got his start right yeah um and uh I wish I'd gone back so I I have images of like doing exactly the same thing let's go to the ground lanes or something but but it takes uh I mean everybody could do it everybody should take an improv class it's just fun it is that. just yeah. fun like it's a good way to like ha- actually have like an enjoyable weekday and not live for the weekend. Like I, I get excited because I'm like, Oh, Mondays, I actually have something fun going on. So yeah, I'm liking it a lot. You take, do you, I'm sure you did improv because you studied at USC, right? Did they have? Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite uh, classes and I actually studied improv after him with a guy named Stephen book who mm-hmm. still teaches um, yeah. this fantastic technique of using improv for dramatic, like everyone thinks, Oh, improv, it's gotta be funny. But he actually applies the techniques of improv to a script, to a drama. It could be a dramatic script. It could be any kind of script. And it's really, it's, it's just fascinating. It's really, really fun work. And I, I to this day, um, I use the techniques that I learned in, in, in my improv classes for sure. You can never stop learning. Never stop no, learning. No, and we never really know what the problem, we're... you know, like, didn't you, didn't you say <laughs> like when you were like CG's age, you know, like, oh, when I get this age, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have it down. I'm not going to get nervous. I'm not going to, I know I'm going to know what I'm doing. And it blows my mind that like, here I am, uh, I've been acting for what, 40 years professionally. Right. Yeah. And I still get on a set. And something will happen and I'll be like, oh my God, I have no idea what to do. I'm like completely lost. I'm like, oh shit. It's, uh, it's, it's so it's refreshing because it is true. It's one thing if you've been on a series or a set for a number of years, then you're really comfortable. But every time you show up to do something new, like I had some like what butterflies today because even though I've been doing this podcast for a couple of years, I'm still, this is something new. It, it's still, and the body tells me like, this is new. And until yeah. you get used to it, and and you're so right, like especially if you're a guest star on a te- on a television show, that you really are thrown to the wolves. You better know your shit. They're not taking care of you at all. Yeah, nobody's nobody's. Yeah, <laughs> especially the director. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's interesting is like sometimes I can't tell you how many times because directors in TV really, um, unless they're you know the. Uh, supervising producer or their re- repetitive directors sometimes they're they're guests and it's an audition for them too oh my god yeah I, yeah i've been treated the worst by those guest directors and i'm a guest actor almost to the point where it's like because they didn't cast me and i was in a, on, a, on an arc and at some point and some director said something like he made a comment about how he didn't cast me and he was unhappy with me or something and it literally made me start Jeez. shaking once you just never know what's going to come at you. So it's important. Yeah, it's true. I just always say true. the more prepared I am and I know my shit, 
no matter what happens, it can't throw me because that's, that, that has to come out of the mouth and I have to hit my marks. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of pressure. Maybe I should uh, rethink this. No, whole no, thing. no. It, listen, it's, but it's the best, best pressure you can have, you know, where it's, it's like so much fun. It's, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, we're, we're the luckiest people on the planet yeah. to be able to do this for a living and do it for the rest of our lives. It's like, it's crazy. It's crazy. You know, we get to do this. There's a way of turning that energy because it, I used to identify it as fear, but I've lear- I'm learning to turn it as excitement. This just means I'm way focused. I mean, some of the biggest stars in the world, I was at Peter Fonda. Oh no, sorry. Um, Jane Fonda. Henry Fonda, <laughs> who talked about, um, was it Henry Fonda? Who talked about all of his nerves were in his little pinky and he held it right there. And he just like, he, uh, he located it right there or, there was Geraldine Page, I think, who said she was just had terrible stage fright. But there is something that's always the lead up to something. And then when you get in it and you're trained to be in the moment, we're in the moment and we're and we're safe and and we belong here and we take our time and we know what we're doing. You'll get to that point, but you, you'll never get there if you don't take action and practice and do it. Like we're doing this podcast right now. Okay, yeah. mom. <laughs> All right, <laughs> mom. mom. <laughs> I was talking about calling this thing bitchin' because everyone said in the 80s, bitchin' man. And CG's like, yeah, whatever, mom. <laughs> I know, but is every one of your podcasts going to have the word bitch in it? I mean, I don't, I don't understand. I mean, that's ridiculous. You're like the nicest, <laughs> most wonderful woman in the world. Um, I have. We've been throwing that around because it's. we're going to call it Bye Bitches because at the end of the podcast, it's called Bye. You know, I'd say Bye Bitches. Mm-hmm. And people love that. And this is kind of an extension of that because people have been asking me, asking if we could continue to do it. But we can't continue to watch the OC. We've done all the episodes and I can't start over. <laughs> <laughs> I need a break. That doesn't mean we can't talk about it. But I'm sure we'll always have some conversations about it. But we've, I feel like we've exhausted that subject for now. That's fine with me. We're, Let's move on. Oh, I didn't tell you, CG, that we were going to rewatch the OC on this podcast. Oh, surprise! It's actually another OC podcast. I do want to say, since this podcast is rewatching iconic films of the past, what were your feelings about watching? Like, you're now that you're 40 years into it, how do you feel? What would you say to that guy back in 1990 and, and 92? How does it feel? Oh, gosh. Um, I would say, gosh, you were young and and handsome like I, I i didn't realize how handsome i was <laughs> i would have relaxed i was said you know you're good looking enough don't worry about how good looking you are um i would have uh, <laughs> um uh i would have uh you know it's it's what you always tell yourself at a younger age you know just relax take it easy don't worry about stuff um you know the 20s is our our t- cg i i you know the 20s are tough for for me they were tough cuz you worry about so much stuff uh a lot of anticipatory anxiety you know about and, um, you know, the, the blessing of getting older is you're like, wow, I really didn't need to worry about all that stuff. I really, um, you know, should have just enjoyed things a little bit more. Um, so that, that's what I'd say to him. Just, you know, take it easy. Enjoy it. You're a very lucky human being to be involved in all of these movies and films and television shows. Yeah. And I mean, you're just one of the luckiest people on the planet. Have fun. Yeah, I'll take yeah. the advice too. <laughs> I'll take it into good, consideration. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. like do you, you're good looking enough. <laughs> you're good looking enough. Well, and I think it's important to like you know, obviously it's a vain it's a vain industry. And when you uh, there are plenty of times where I'm like, oh, I think I was getting roles because I had the right look. I know there's better actors. You know, I always tell myself. <laughs> yeah. And then when now that now that I'm getting older, it's because of how I look. I'm not getting cast. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. is vanity, yeah. and there at some point yeah. we've got to drop that and accept. You know, like in Ghosted, I just were. Um, you're you're in a new sh- uh, film with uh, Anna, Chris Evans, Chris Evans and, Anna DeArmas. Anna DeArmas, yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're playing Grandpa. No, <laughs> no, you're, so you're a dad. No, I'm playing. I'm playing Chris Evans' dad. That's what, so I started watching it last night, and I could swear I was like, "What? He's a dad. What? Why? Why did I have grandpa in my head?" 
<laughs> Thank goodness. I was like, no. Because I had a great, I have a very gray beard. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Gray beard. Yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of fun to work on. Dexter Fletcher, the director of that, is uh, he directed Rocket Man too. So oh. I worked with him there, and he's just like he's a barrel of laughs. And yeah, that that movie was was a lot of fun. Right. Um, one more four one one question: What is your favorite film right now, or your favorite movie of all time? Jeez, um, my favorite film right now. Uh, I just rewatched a movie that I think might be my favorite movie of all time, and it's called Paris is Burning. Have you guys seen that movie? No. No. It's a documentary about drag queens in the 90s in New York City. Oh, wow. And it is, I, I, when it came out, I was blown away, and because I was living in that neighborhood, I was living in the West Village down by the piers where... Um, uh, there were a lot of, uh, trans, it was a big transvestite community and, um, the meatpacking district. And, uh, I just, it, it's just the most beautiful, hilarious, uh, poignant, uh, moving documentary, uh, I, I could possibly imagine. And, and being an actor, I just, I just related to, um, you know, it's, it's, there's been so much anti-drag, anti-LGBTQ, anti-trans uh, stuff. I live in Texas. Um, the, it seems like the whole state, every red state is passing these horrific laws. And I've been wondering, why am I so disturbed by this? Yeah. You know, like, why, why do I feel such a kinship to people who are transitioning and who um, do the art of drag. Uh, and, and it's because uh, I am one of them. Because I, I've transitioned. Like, if you're an actor, you're, you want to be someone, uh, someone that you're not, you weren't born into being. And mm -hmm. there's a freedom and there's a liberation into that. And I, I don't really know how to express it, but I just find Paris is Burning to be... Mm -hmm the most beautiful movie, most human movie uh, I've seen in a long time. And there's really one hilarious moment at the end where they're all sitting on this car out by this pier in New York City and they're just complaining about their boyfriends and guys and, and they're just like complaining about men and how men are so terrible. And of course, they are all men. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but um, <laughs> So it's so fucking funny to me. It's so brilliant. It's so human that we um, uh, are, I don't know, it's just, uh, it's just fantastically... Um, what is the word, you know, um, it's a, a celebration human, of life. Yeah. And, art. and, and the, yeah. the incongruities, mm -hmm. the, the complications of, of our spirit and our mind and our bodies and, uh, our imaginations. And I don't know. It's, it's just, uh, it's great. You should check it out. Right. It's really good. Right. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Love Potion was one of your first films. And for our listeners who aren't so familiar with this gem, <laughs> here's a quick synopsis, CG. The synopsis of Love Potion number nine. Uh, it debuted in 92, starring Tate Donovan and Sandra Bullock. Uh, it takes its name from the 1959 hit song Love Potion number nine. And it is about a love potion that enables a person to make people of the opposite sex become completely infatuated with them simply by talking. It was Dale Lawner's directional debut. He is also know f known for writing My Cousin Vinny, Ruthless People, and Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. You haven't seen any of those movies, have you, CG? Uh, Probably not. No. <laughs> but those are great <laughs> ones. But I will soon. Yeah. I yeah. will soon. <laughs> right? Yeah. Launer. Yeah, is that how you say it? Launer? Dale Launer. 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 -E That's yeah. how I said He's it. He's done some pretty iconic things. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. He was, a, he was a great writer. So, you you were, you were came about in the 80s, starting with movies like No Small Affair with John Cryer is your first mm -hmm. one. And then you did mm -hmm. Space Camp. Yeah, and was this was really your first leading role. 
And how old were you? How did it come about? I was uh, 26 or 27, and um, I just auditioned, you know, um, the old-fashioned way um, <laughs> for Dale. Uh, and uh, it was really funny. It was actually really funny. I went in, I did the audition. I thought it went pretty good. And it was in New York City, and I was walking down the street, and I had just sort of read that um, if you hear your name in like, you know, sounds like, um, like a car honking its horn or something falling and you think you heard, you know, your name, it's a sign of severe narcissism. So I'm walking down the street, I, I get out of this audition and, uh, I, I think I hear my name, Tate, and I'm like, oh Jesus, man, you are such a narcissist. You know, it's probably just a car honking or whatever. And I'm like, here, Tate. Day. And I'm like, that's probably just like an elevator door or something, or, you know, somebody, <laughs> or, you know, somebody yelling something up. And then I realize, I look up, and out of the casting office, it was like eight stories up, is Dale Lohner going, Tate, come back here. <laughs> this is before cell phones, and you know, like, <laughs> like, so he was just screaming for me to come back up and read again because he, uh, because Sandra Bullock was in the the office as well. And I had never heard of Sandra Bullock or whatever. And so he immediately wanted us to do like a, um, a chemistry read together. And um, so we did that. And, and um, yeah, and we ended up both getting the part. We, we were psyched. So Sandra was in the room. Well, she was in the waiting room when I left, but I, I didn't notice her. Like I, I just sort of like split through a bunch of, you know, actors for all different parts. And he, like, right then and there was like, oh, this guy's good. Oh, this guy, this girl's good. And, um, you know, like, he just matched us up. And he wanted me to come back and read with her. So that's how you guys met, actually. You weren't dating before that. We met uh, during the, the making of the movie. Yeah, we met auditioning. And then um, we were both dating other people at the time. And then yeah. we did the movie together. And uh, by the end of the movie, we weren't dating other people. Ah, as much yeah it, that <laughs> does happen that does happen yes that happens yeah you know I, when i was researching this as i do uh, i noticed that you know i had such memories of it because cg literally i think i was your age i think i was 23 when it came out and but then i was researching it and the 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 reviews were mixed but i remember my friends and i loving this and if you didn't see it in the movie theater you definitely saw it playing on HBO or renting it. I mean, it was something that you always like I would watch over and over again on a Sunday hungover or something. <laughs> but um, I mean, one review said that it was glib humor and an emphasis on feel good values aimed squarely at the dating crowd and 20 something couples. And then it mentions the unknown cast with an unknown cast. I mean, do you have any memories of the reactions to the film and and, and was it your first time, um, like going to premieres and, and what was, and was there any fame that came from it? Like what, what, what are your no, reflections you know, it on totally that? tanked in the theaters. Okay. Um, <laughs> and it did, it, nobody went to see it. it. It only really came to life when it, when it got on cable and right. people watched it, um, you know, the second time around. Um, and it seemed to be on like HBO, like 24 right. hours a day. It was like a love potion number nine channel or something like that. <laughs> right. Um, so that's where most people saw it. But yeah, um, I'm trying to think. I mean, yeah, I'd been to premieres. You know, I was in Memphis Bell and um, some other, you know, Space Camp had a right. big premiere and stuff like that. But yeah, it, it, it totally tanked in the box office. It was, it was a total bummer. We were, we were, we were disappointed. But, um, you know, uh, what are you going to do? But we're still talking about it today. You know, it yeah. was, you know, <laughs> I know like I know. I, people... People love that movie. It's hilarious. You, you know, know, like I said, I because I just love to, you know, see where the, this this project, this entity, this this living thing that was this movie. People are still talking about it on all kinds of podcasts. And it's fun to go through the IMDb conversations or reviews. They're just from a few years ago. You know, they're, they're not from, you know, a few decades ago. They're, they're recent. So people are still discussing it. That's hilarious. I wonder how it holds up in terms of like CG. Did you, did you watch it? I did. Oh yes. yeah. Oh yeah. So, so how does it hold up? Like, um, in terms of, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a whole me too thing, you know, like, like how <laughs> right. does it hold up? Like, and it seems like 
it's kind of like like the scene with uh, Mary Mara, who is such a great actress. So Unfortunately, wonderful. she passed away. It was did she? So did tr- she know? Yeah, she passed away. It was such a bummer. She oh, was so wow. young. Um, oh wow! And uh, just recently, like a couple of years ago, I did not and, know that. Um, but she was so great in that, and and you know, of course, she she plays a prostitute, and there are like five hundred guys who are just like madly in love with her, and they chase her down the street. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that would fly today. You know, like, I, that seemed pretty scary. Yeah, there were definitely scenes in it that I think would not fly, like if making a movie today. Um, I think the the worst one, um, I mean, we haven't even gotten into the start of the movie, but when you go to the sorority house, <laughs> that was... When I'm on love potion number eight. Right. When yeah. you're on love yes. potion number eight. Um, yes. And it's, it was a little icky to me because I just graduated college and like, it, like college girls are like 18. And I don't yeah. know how old your character right. was, but I was I was twenty six. Let's just put it that way. Okay, yeah. yeah so yeah, that's yeah. not yeah. That right. was icky. That's totally not great. icky. Um, icky. Yeah, that's not great. That's not great. <laughs> yeah, it was just um, obviously it wasn't you know showing you in the bedrooms or anything, but what was implied um, was was icky. Yes, was definitely something that I don't <laughs> think would fly today in movies. No. Um, yeah, I think it's a great way to actually segue into the movie itself because the whole concept is, it's wonderful, wacky, and they have these very iconic hysterical scenes that I don't remember, but the, but it brings about a bigger question of consent. The whole thing is consent. And that's why, you know, so because your character, Paul Matthews, he's a lonely biochemist and the movie opens Kind of, you know, with the the credits have the song playing, which is a a very famous song, but it shows you guys, you've got a voiceover and you're walking and it says, from time to time, my buddies and I do a fun thing like bowling, but one day we go to a gypsy and you have an iconic scene with Anne Bancroft, who CG was Mrs. Mrs. Robinson. Robinson. Okay. She knows. Yeah. There you go. Okay, good. Okay, good. Thank you. I know some things. (laughs) Yeah. But, but she's, first of all, the scene goes to the, that, that we're on, that we come to understand that this guy is so lonely and has had no women in his life that your palm shows no women. And it's so unique. She needs to take a picture, a Polaroid for his, for her sister. No, no women, (laughs) never, no, no women. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and she implies she asks if you're gay, and you know, are you are you boy kissy boy? <laughs> and and she ends up giving you this thing in a little bindle, and she's like, "You need this." And and it, and I thought, okay, so first of all, I have to ask you, what was it like working? And then you have some scene, that's another scene with her later. What was it like working with Anne Bancroft as this amazing cameo in this movie? It was uh, it was like a dream come true. I was really? just you know I I was infatuated with her since I was a kid, and and yeah. you know she's just an amazing actress and married to Mel Brooks, so she's just like royalty. And um, the funny thing is, is that Dale went to a dinner party years before Love Potion Number Nine and saw her do this character of a gypsy, you know, like a gypsy fortune teller. So he wrote that part for her, uh, knowing that she was like hysterical and really funny and like came up with all this great stuff. And what was really interesting, you know, she only worked like a day or two on the film, right? You know, she just comes in and does her scenes. And um, it was one of those rare times where um, there was a flicker in the light. So we had to redo all of her scenes, it was crazy. It was crazy. We had to like redo the whole thing. So, so we got to do them twice, which was a lot of fun uh, for me. But and I don't know so much fun for her. But yeah, I just remember like it was my first experience where you know like uh, you know you're on a professional set. Everybody like you know there's the the technical thing you never even think about. You know like they check the gate. Remember Melinda when they'd say check the gate and they'd actually check a gate in case um, there's a hair in it. Right. Yeah. There was like a, the film emulsion, you know, in these old cameras, uh, there could be like a little hair in it, like the, um, the, the film could, could disintegrate or whatever and get a little 
part of it in in the in the gate and it could show up on the negative and so they always checked to make sure there was an, a hair in the gate and at any rate so yeah that was that was crazy but it was a, it was a dream come true to work with her for sure I can only imagine. Yeah, she's there, there's just so and this is one of the reasons I love doing rewatches because you you watch a movie and you you go on the journey, but when you're watching to actually pay attention to all the details, you forget about those things and they're just delightful. You know, you think about like god, how come I I, I need to make choices like that. She was so good. <laughs> but but we he so in the meantime, you know, we after he gives her this, then we meet Diane and First of all, there's a lot of ugly duckling turns into beautiful princess type movies. This was one of the best ones. Obviously, Sandra is um, amazingly beautiful, but this is a hysterical, I guess you'd call it um, a down makeover. What do you call it? Unmakeover, whatever you want to call it, the I ugly just duckling. I want to say th- why Sandra Bullock gets cast in so many things where they try to make her this unattractive unwanted like actress and it's like she is beautiful like diane like nerdy diane was still like beautiful like i don't know why sandra keeps getting cast in all these roles (laughs) that are like this but it's just like yeah it was she went on to do like uh she went on to do um sleep uh, while you're sleeping with peter gallagher but I thought they did a really good job with the teeth and the, and she, first of all, I think what could have been really overdone, you guys did very calm, you did very underplayed nuanced uh, role characters. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> like, did I? <laughs> did I? I don't remember. <laughs> with yeah, the yeah. Um, you know, well, what's funny is that, that, you know, it's funny that you say Sandra um, always gets cast as these, you know, ugly people and she's gorgeous. Well, that is the, one of the geniuses of Sandra Bullock is that she doesn't see herself as beautiful at all. I've never met a woman who is so stunning and just considers herself like, you know, just not attractive. Like she just, and, and not in a, not in a bad way or like a, you know, compliment me way, you know, like, you know, like you always hear like these models say, oh, I was so, you know, dorky when I was, a, you know, and you're like, you were never dorky. You're always gorgeous. Don't give me that. But Sandra really has, I mean, I think that's what her, where her sense of humor comes in, where she's really super funny. Mm-hmm. She acts like she's was never pretty her entire life. You know what I mean? She's always been, had to be funny, uh, had to be smart. Um, uh, She never relied on her looks. I I don't know what it is. It's just like, it's, I think it's came from her mom who de-emphasized her looks in everything and wanted her to be super capable at everything else and never rely on her looks. I'm not too sure really what the psychology of that is, but I've never met a woman so beautiful who, who doesn't feel beautiful uh, and, as Sandra. And so self-deprecating. I mean, she's... So self-deprecating. It's amazing. It's hilarious. Well, and it's interesting because sometimes when some people, you know, you meet people in this industry who I've actually said some of the ugliest people I've ever met are the super, not supermodels, but people that look like supermodels. And when they open their mouth, they either have no personality or it's an ugly personality. It's, you know, or um, it's so many people are attractive, but when they open their mouth, are they kind? Are they giving? are, Are they funny? Are they... Uh, do they have something to offer to the world? And are they, you know, like, I think if you go through life with, um, with super looks, it tends to make one maybe narcissistic, a little self-centered or something, but, but no, she does a wonderful job here. I just think the fun, it, it plays so well because so, so many times it doesn't work where you see somebody who's so stunning, but in this one, it worked and she just, <laughs> And it didn't look overdone. And she's explaining to her friends about she's a monkey psychologist. And she's, I mean, and and it just is, it's just so charming. And then, of yeah. course, we move over to to Paul at the bar with his friends. And he's explaining how much he, so we, in, we meet her. And then he explains how much he actually likes her. And then they, they dare him for a hundred bucks to go over to talk to this um, girl at the bar, which is probably the, one of the best harshest written speeches any girl has ever given to a guy baffled (laughs) baffled what What do you mean i have been at bars with my friends 
where men, boys have come up to me and I'm like, please leave me alone. I have never in my wildest dreams thought of speaking to someone that way. Right. Like that was out of left field, like <laughs> mean, vile, like I th- <laughs> she just met you. You didn't, <laughs> I was baffled. I was like, that is so mean. And then but asking, well, like, you know, sometimes you got to be cruel to be kind. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, um, you know, if you're not interested in somebody, then you, you know, maybe it's best to be, you know, a hundred percent like, Hey, no. I mean, I've, I've been you know, straightforward, mean, like, hey, Mm -hmm. please leave me alone. Like, I'm with my friends. (laughs) Or like, get away from me. Like, I've said get away from me before, but she was like, why would you think I'd be interested in you? Someone who looks like you, (laughs) why would you be interested in me? But it's but it's a setup. It's wonderful writing. Because it's a a setup. Yes, actually it it is, but (laughs) this I just remembered the first time I met you, Tate. I walked up to you in a bar. We, you were sitting next to Grant at the Formosa, and I That's walked up to you. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I walked up to you, and you just done that TV show with um, Charlotte Ross, and I knew Charlotte, uh-huh. so I tapped you on the shoulder, and I was like, "Hey!" And you just you looked over your shoulder, just kind of like this, like I'm in, you know. And, and I was like, "I'm friends with Charlotte Ross," and you literally were like, "Uh huh." And you turn back to your beer. <laughs> that didn't go over well. That may may not have been the best, uh, you know, person you could have uh, picked or whatever. But then, I, then when we were on the set of the OC, yeah, and we, we talked were about working Charlotte together, immediately. Yeah, and I right. told you that story. I I even said the same thing. I was yeah. like, you know, I work, and I remember you being. Because I know you now. I remember you being like, "Uh huh," and you didn't. <laughs> we we then you know I had to like you know anyway I had to earn your trust. I think you were <laughs> equating me. I, I'm anyway. sure. I'm sure it wasn't like that in my mind. I'm sure it was like I I, I don't I, you know I don't remember the the first time we met uh, in at the Formosa. No, uh, you wouldn't. I probably was hammered. You know, I mean it was the Formosa. You know right. what I mean. In the '90s, so uh, you know there was a lot of a lot of things were forgotten that were said and done at the Formosa. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been, I don't normally in like probably had a little liquid courage, and I'm like doink doink on the back of your shoulder. <laughs> Hi. I generally I generally respond well to uh, women who are you know go doink doink doink. <laughs> I'm surprised that I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I didn't say more to you. No, you were you were nice enough, but I, you know, I you definitely were like, oh, cool, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we do find out he gets he gets rejected terribly, and you know they go home to their respective. But then I, the other quick scene that I want to talk about. Obviously, you throw away this thing, but then the cat eats it, and you've got these cats going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was it like? I'm a cat person, actually. CG is too, but. What was it like working with that many cats? Well, I'm alert, highly allergic to cats. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> of course, right? Of course. So I, th- I was pretty doped up on antihistamines at the time. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> you blow up into one big hive. <laughs> yeah, it's always, it's classic. That that's a classic thing, CG of of acting. Like something always throws you off. Like it has to be a scene about cats. And like, how do you fucking do a scene where you're like, you know, wasted on, um, you know, antihistamines? So you tripping over the cat get... was an accident and wasn't part of the scene just because you had so much allergy medicine. <laughs> yeah, in you. I was doped up. Yeah, I was totally doped up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i actually went to when i was doing days of our lives i went to vegas for the first time i was only 20 years old and i had been taking accutane for acne and i didn't realize how to- anyway i had an allergic reaction it was toxic and i ended up in the er on a benadryl, benadryl drip because my whole body was turning into a hive and i had to oh go to work god. the next week and take benadryl the whole time and i'd be sitting there like right, asleep Kind of in between takes on a soap opera with hives coming and going. So yeah, you kind of got to go with the flow. You never know what's going to happen. Survival acting. Yeah. I was allergic to Vegas, if you can believe it. <laughs> it really was. I got nervous anyway. <laughs> oh man. 
uh, so then he takes the results to uh, to Diane and they discuss it and they decide to test it on her little dressed up monkeys. <laughs> and of course, they do it full strength. And we hear a little ah, and, and think, is she sounding normal? But then all of a sudden, kaboom, kaboom. And, and the door, and the wall breaks down and her mate tears after her. And bangs her cage into oblivion and passes out, which is, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen that scene or will again ever again. <laughs> Another but, scene that dropped my mouth open. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was, that must have been a little icky as well. <laughs> I mean, it was not the same kind of icky, but definitely a little icky. Like, and they thought he died. They thought the monkey orgasmed to death like <laughs> I'm talking about this is like who came up with this Dale Lawner I, it's so funny you guys bring that up because I remember reading that in the script and shooting those scenes and I was just like, I didn't like this. I love chimps and yeah, yeah. it was really fun to hang out with chimps um, those days but I I did. I did. I, I didn't think it was going to be funny. I mm. didn't think it was going to work. Uh, you know, it's difficult to work with animals and try to get the chimp to hump a cage. Trust me, it looked, took all day. You know, to like Aww. work on these. You know, with these these animals. And I, and and you know what? That is the scene that everyone talks to me about. Like everyone is like is like oh, that was the funny. You know, so. I, I, that scene just reminds me that I really don't know what is funny and what is not going to be funny. You just got to, you know, do it because I was so set against that, that scene and I was so wrong. I mean, people, people love that fucking scene. It was crazy. We always wonder, they always have these disclaimers and no animals were harmed, but then, you know, the, then you hear stories of actual, you know, there was that, um, race, um, uh, race horse racing, uh, oh yeah, series mm -hmm. that got shut on down. HBO, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It was like a Dustin Hoffman mm -hmm. thing, I think. Yeah, and it got shut down because horses were getting. I mean, in racing, I guess horses do get hurt, but when it's involved in a production, it's. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, anim no animals. No animals on were. Set. I remember. I remember the animal people being. You know, the animal people on sets. You know this, Mindy. They're 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 really all over everybody, and nobody messes with the animals. And it was it was that way, definitely on the it, set for sure. They, they're called Wranglers. And I wranglers, remember yes. I actually, yeah, we had a Wrangler because wrangler we had to have cockroaches. And this guy brought oh. his precious cockroaches that were, <laughs> that I, and I was like, that he bred these. And he, I was like, and he was like, this is my little pet. Be nice to it. And I'm like, really? And it was like, that was, that was really hard to, to handle. But yes, <laughs> no, they, they'll they protect, look at CG's face. <laughs> they like to CG and Adam, my husband. They like to mess with me with cockroaches because they're the freakiest things ever. The, anyway, I hate okay. cockroaches. Anyway, change um, the subject. So anyway, Diane and Paul decide that they're going to test them uh, after they dilute it. They're going to test it on themselves, and they separate for three weeks. And they each go take a different path. You know, she she just um, decides. You know, she gets out of a parking ticket be, and. And then she she has it and, and bumps into an Italian car mogul and the Prince of England hears her. Whereas Tate is uh, running through a sorority house mad. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is appropriate, like the what a woman would do and what a man would do. I, I you know I hate to admit it, but it's kind of felt accurate. You know it's interesting. Well, like it just goes back to like the. The, the monkeys, monkeys. like <laughs> yeah right <laughs> well it goes back to the scene with, with diane's the, friends primal. yeah with the four girls primal. at the table and they're talking about like some scientific experiment and the girl like diane's like oh yeah you know like they effed themselves to death and the woman goes it's just like other men and right goes, right yeah. she's like they hit the button but uh yeah so he he, but the first thing he does, because I, I do love the, the, the details of him taking a shower and, and your character has this, you know, you get a little looser. I, I like, I love to see the progression of characters, how their hair changes over the, over the course of a film. And of course you have this perfect little comb over and you go right. back to the scene of the crime with the girl. And the reason that was so harsh, her monologue was so harsh, uh, 
is that you get to whisper to her and the payback feels good. You don't always like the, you know, uh, you, I will do anything. Well, first you say, um, what does she say? Um, I can be mysterious. And you say, I don't like mysterious. And she says, well, I can be direct. Eh, I don't know if I like direct. And then she just mauls you. This was and another said, mouth open scene. <laughs> <laughs> she is trying to have Did you ever that- have your mouth closed during this <laughs> <No>. film? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> What's your? Tries to have didn't... sex with you at the bar. <laughs> the stuff was, you know, love potion number eight, man. It's pretty intense stuff. She, yeah, but no, it, I think the best, and this is where you said you can. I'll do this. I'll take. Let's. We'll go home if you can answer one question because she says if you if you can name the designer of this top, nobody could do that. Right. And then you right. say something scientific, and you say bye bye, and you're mm-hmm. gone. So then mm. you're off to the races. Right. And, Sorry. I right. skipped, and skipped then you're over that. The well, like, I mean, and it's, you know, listen, Tate, the 80s, this movie came at the end of a decade of a lot of sexploitation teen movies like Porky's and Animal House. And I mean, and every movie had booby shots and you couldn't get a movie sold. I mean, I was saying this to CG and this movie didn't have a booby in it. It didn't have anything bare in it. It was mild compared to what had been out there in Hollywood for that for that mm-hmm. decade. Did you ever get offered any of those movies or did you ever turn down any of those movies? Were you conscious of, of I definitely uh, auditioned for a lot of them and did not get them. <laughs> Good. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, for almost all of them, I, I definitely auditioned for them. It's hilarious. Yeah. Well, I was thinking it because that, one of the things about this podcast that I was, you know, I remember, and I'm I'm not going to tell her details yet, but I want CG's reaction to something like Porky's or Animal House or, you know, these these were the movies that we were watching and kind of formed our informed or formed our youths, and it definitely this is where you're saying CG that I don't think we're making movies like that anymore right we're we're a no. little more a little more awareness yeah watching it now it's just it's definitely not a film that would be made today and if it if the same concept was made it would have a lot more um i think it'd be a lot more yeah sensitivity is the right word like it would be a lot more sensitive of you know all the progressing ideals and everything now like yeah, uh, they just yeah. wouldn't make movies like this anymore at all. Yeah, I mean it's 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 very sexist and very yeah, it's just yeah, it's but, embarrassing and terrible. <laughs> well, but I think what we need to we remind ourselves that okay, so Paul and Diane have been separate. She has to show up and pick, get him out of jail because he got the, the panty, panty was raid it, the panty law. raid law or something, and she, and he and all of a sudden she we didn't they they. They uh, spared us that scene where she has to get all dolled up. Now she just looks amazing and he's talking to her. But we already know that he already l- liked her from before, but that she seemed unavailable. And they have this scene where she's, you know, now she's um, uh, the, the Prince of England is after her. And, and all of a sudden, Paul is like, well, wait, I like you. And now they have this realization or... He has this realization that he really there's there's something brewing because something probably all, all, always was there. And when they discuss the, the, their their insecurity and what this potion does for them, because all of a sudden it, it gets it it um, erases any insecurity. Right. Yeah. It gives them confidence that they yeah, never both, had both in the their characters. entire life. Yeah. Yeah. They, they develop confidence from the whole experience. Yeah. I mean, if you could take CG at your age, love potion number eight, would you? It's a very like morally loaded question. I yeah, especially in front of your mom. You know <laughs> what I mean? Well, um, Come on. Well, okay, pause. What is she I would say? not use it the way that ta- that your character used it. First of all, well, yeah, of course not. Absolutely not. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about anything. How about the R-rated. way Sanders' character used it though? Um. To get out of a ticket. <laughs> I I see no harm in using it to get out of like rolling through a stop sign or something like that. Or like... Or dating the Prince of England. You know, I'll have a fling with the Prince of England. Like, <gasps> as long as it's... Like, she came to her senses and was like, yes, obviously I can't marry him. You know, like, I think there <laughs> is like a moral... You know, how... What if how it was much Ian Selma Halder? 
Okay, don't even make me go there because that's going to make me do all... I'm going to switch over to how Paul was if you bring up Ian Summerhalder. So don't even start with me, mother. <laughs> Basically, what happens is Tate... Or Tate, Tate... Diane and Paul now... Are now we get to my favorite part of the movie. This and and I love a classic love montage, and it's so sweet. And you're having a good time, and you guys clearly had good chemistry. And and he's gonna propose, and he knocks on the door, and she's not there. Like she, oh, I forgot to ask you about ghosted, but she ghosted him. <laughs> yeah. And I felt so bad for her. And of course, you know, first of all, you're driving a Carmen Ghia, which was such a Awesome car. I love that car. It was so great. What I, a, I was, yeah. What a cool car. It was very Molly Ringwald, like, um, you know, in yeah. Pretty in Pink. Yeah. Those were, if you yeah. had a Carmen Ghia in those days, that would, you were cool. Like everybody very wanted cool. that. Yeah. No idea what that Dale is. Dale was very obsessed with cars and the type of car you drove and stuff like that. And, and uh, yeah, he was like, and it had to be green. It, had, it, was, it was awesome. He was, he was really into it. And driving that car was so much fun. It was great. Yeah. Is the car in the end, was that Carmen Gear or is that Porsche? Yeah, was that was a, cream? no, that was, yeah, that was a Porsche. Yeah. That was a, um, um, uh, God, it was a remake of the, of the, the Porsche that James Dean died in. Yes. It wasn't, it wasn't like an, it was like a kit car Porsche, yep. you know, it was like, uh, made to look like it but yeah it was that was a pretty cool car too That's yeah really cg cool you're gonna car. see the carmen Ghia is the car that he was driving never heard of carmen Ghia until this conversation oh great see you get to learn something you never get to heard learn of something it. so <laughs> you learn about automotive <laughs> <laughs> but then she so all of a sudden when he finds she says something magical has happened because she doesn't return I'm in love with Gary. And I, that's where I went, oh, the ick factor. This well, uh, actor, Dale, um, Dale Midkiff. I was going to say, I think it's important to note that that montage is like seven days. That montage is only seven days. And at the end of that, he's ready to propose. Oh. But I've known her a long time. <laughs> But like... So, well, when you know, you know, you know. But isn't it sweet that they weren't... That they actually, after all of this time, they're not using the potion. They have this real moment. And that, and it's almost like, here's the end of the movie. But then the third act comes and the shenanigans begin. And it's when the movie gets really <laughs> wild. Because yeah. he's like, he's so devastated. He's like writhing on the floor. And I'm like, has that ever happened to any of you? Yes. Kind of writhing on the floor. And it, yes. It, it yes. Has. yes. Yes. It has. It's, Mom, it's not I'm sure we could talk about that situation. You probably know plenty of my writhing on the floor times. Oh, uh, oh my gosh. CG knows. That's the thing about this. She knows all my darkest secrets and my skeletons. Uh-oh. So, okay. And I know yours. No, uh, actually, I don't. You probably don't, actually. <laughs> I think this is the, uh, we won't talk, put it this way. The rule is what happens on the podcast stands on the podcast. We <laughs> and with the people who Let's listen talk about to my the skeletons, podcast. You know. Tate, you have a skeleton you want to share with us? <laughs> um, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, okay. So, of course, at some point he's devastated, but then Marissa, the wonderful Mary Mara comes. She she really did add some some flavor to this. And she somehow you know, stumbles upon this um, spray and ends up um, talking him into giving him his stereo equipment and telling her about the potion. So now she's in the know. And, uh, and after he comes to, he gets the idea that, oh my God, what if she's under the spell? And because, uh, because that was the first time Paul had been under the spell. And so now, of course, the, um, Gypsy lets her know, lets him know that he needs potion number nine that will wipe out anything that's uh, not true or not real, um, even potion number eight. So he's now on a mission. So <laughs> there is this scene where you have to tell all of your friends about what's going on. And I got to give it to you as an actor. You, you're just, you're literally delivering this exposition which is what really difficult. Don't you think exposition like this? Here's the plan. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And you're, and it, and they reasonably are looking at you like, what the fuck? This is so crazy because it sounds ridiculous. And you did a really good job delivering that. I just want to let you know that. Well, you know, it's really funny. Um, 
Dale was a, is really a writer. He this is the only movie he ever directed, and um, he would. It was so funny. He wouldn't really, you know, we'd rehearse the scene. We'd even start shooting the scene sometimes. And he'd be like, okay, stop. And he would disappear for like an hour and, and then come back with new pages. And we're like, hey, man, we could use the old pages. You just have to direct us, you know, like point us in the right direction. And, if, you know, we can do it in the performance. But he was like, no, 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 you got you to gotta say these lines. I've rewritten the whole thing. So we'd have to learn the lines. So that whole, that whole scene wasn't in the original script. He just, one day, he was like, listen, I need you to memorize this monologue and like he gave it to me and like 45 minutes later while they were lighting i just had to fucking go for it and um talk wow. about like you know like yeah it was totally uh, you know thrown at me and i actually remember it being one of the sort of more fun um days on set or or just a day where where i was like wow i, I memorized this like three-page monologue in 30 minutes and it came out great. Like, you know, like, uh, it was like, he threw me a huge curveball, and, um, it ended up pretty good. Yeah. It was, it was, that great. was a fun moment. That can actually be interesting when, yeah, it, it can be interesting when they give you that and you're like, you know what? I have to memorize this and they give you a half an hour to, to memorize something. And, and you think, well, there, if I mess it up, I'm not, nothing's expected of me. There's almost That's a right. freedom in it. Yes, there's a freedom in it. You're yeah. right. You're right. And we get out of our own way. And yes. because I like yeah. to be so prepared. But um, but in that respect, yes. I'm like, if, if I mess it up, what, nobody's going to blame me and put me on the production report on how we got behind. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. You're, you're absolutely right. There is a freedom to like, this just came in, you know, do your best. And like, <laughs> right. all right, man, let's do it. Well, um, I know we're kind of running longish, but I just has CG. I think we should talk about the, um, you know, his, his wild plan to get her to drink this thing. And I got confused because he gets her to drink it and then, then, uh, he doesn't get to drink it, but Gary drinks it. And, and I thought, well, if he drinks it, so I guess I got really confused. Like, why wouldn't she, um, why is she still going to marry him? But anyway, that's what happened. But then because I think it was like, if it was, isn't there something in the, in the, um, and Bancroft character says like, if you truly love her, then it will last forever. But if you don't truly love her, you know, right. If, uh, well, I guess I was confused when, something like that. if she didn't truly love you, she'd hate you forever. Right. Hate you forever. Hate you yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. he has to drink from it and kiss her. But Dale or Dale, sorry, um, Gary drank from it. So I figured that they didn't really love each other. So how would she get still get married? So I was wor I was confused about that. But it, I guess it basically erases everything but the true love. And because she doesn't really love him, somehow they still got married. But our friend, um, uh, Mary Mara it comes back and she tricks him out of this potion. And when he kisses her, it smells like uh, mule sweat. <laughs> but then she's into it, but he's on it, on the potion. So she's infatuated. And the next thing you know, you've got these, I read about it. I guess they hired, it was 300 different extras running through the streets. And that to me, this is why I would never, first of all, I don't want attention from people, <laughs> let alone 300 men running after you. There was like a, I got scared for her safety. Oh, I was I know, too. Right? That's terrifying. Yeah, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. Especially seeing like what the monkey did. It's like, it, they, <laughs> like <laughs> what, <laughs> like if if they got, <laughs> yes. if they got that's to what her, we're picturing. If they got to right. her, that's yeah. I mean, she says stop. But you know what? Thankfully, but. And they all listened to her. That was the interesting thing. You know, they all like she had them under her thumb, which was kind of fun. Because you had we hadn't experimented with a human taking it full strength and talking. Stop. So that's how strong it was. They actually listened. And then she could have I, although it was implied she made them do like a Simon Says thing. And then she gets this look in her eye of like, hmm. I was like, so what what ended up happening happening? We yeah, we don't see her again. I don't know. But then she I think she Hopefully had a lot she, of fun. She took them all of her money. All of their money. That's that's an split. Yeah. But the funny thing is the slow motion, help running through the police station and 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 Paul's 
you know, la, 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 and you yeah, see a stampede. Yeah. And when, he, when, he, when it clears, there's nothing but you left because I, I, I do think that there was that and also that slow push into her at the end of the um, church. And she goes, <laughs> and then the whole church hears there was a, there was very reminiscent of um, John Hughes movies. And, you know, as the some of the camera moves were very characteristic and you could tell that he was trying things that made made the film have some have somewhat of a signature. He was trying as a director. He was trying these different things. Yeah. Yeah. He did a good job. Yeah. It's a, it's a shame that he didn't really get, uh, get to direct after that because it didn't like I said, it didn't do well. But uh, yeah, I mean, he was he was he was fun to work with. He was, uh, yeah, you know. Fun guy. He did some fun things. <laughs> well, he had some so we, wild ideas, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> he definitely has some wild ideas when it comes to male-female relationships. Well, he definitely wrote some of the most iconic um, movies as the ones that we mentioned before. But, you know, t- um, once once Paul gets away from the, from the police station and he got, does kiss her and runs away... I love your voiceover. Oh, there were two voiceovers. And in this voiceover, he says, it, I, I'd like to tell you she showed up five minutes later. It took six. And then <laughs> and she runs out and, and they live happily ever after. But in the beginning of the film, you do, you're one of your very first voiceovers when you're walking into the gypsy, a fortune teller, I should say. I don't know if gypsy is appropriate anymore. She says, uh, so we went to see this fortune teller on 34th and Vine which is the lyric and it takes some skill to not, obviously you're winking at the song, but your delivery was really good. It's like you, you knew you were in on the joke, but it wasn't like you were saying the lyric. I don't know. It, it just um, struck me as like, my friend's talented. He's, he's talented. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those voiceovers, was, you know, there were no voiceovers in the script. Oh, right. So he cut the movie together and he's like, listen, I need you to come. And I would go over, I lived in Hollywood and he lived in Santa Monica and I would drive over to his house and he had this recording studio in his house that he sort of like made. Um, and, uh, I, I, I must've gone over there, I don't know, 20 times and, you know, we'd have dinner and he would have a bottle of wine and we actually became really good friends for a couple of years. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I would, we would, he would try, he would write stuff all the time. Like instead of directing, he wrote. So he would, I, I must've recorded a hundred hours of voiceover for him for all that stuff. It's oh, really? Pretty, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. I think it added a lot to it. It definitely had, um, some, some wonderful additional, um, layers to the storytelling. It's funny when I look at that. I mean, I haven't seen it in a while, but I remember looking at it, uh, I don't know, about five years ago or whatever, and and being like kind of laughing to myself because at the time, I, I, I sort of modeled my character after Woody Allen. Hmm. Um, uh, talk about like inappropriate now, you know, um, but but it was sort of like the, the, the greatest romantic comedic actor I felt at the time was Woody Allen. I mean, Annie Hall to me is, you know, still my favorite film, uh, my favorite Mm -hmm. romantic comedy. And I was just sort of raised on Woody Allen and I can sort of see myself trying to imitate Woody Allen, Um, you know, just like a nerdy scientist and hopelessly romantic and falling in love. And I I don't know, it's really, it was kind of funny. I was like, Jesus, man, what's with the Woody Allen imitation? Right. But it was kind of inconsistent too. It was like sometimes it was me and sometimes it was me trying to be Woody and I don't know, it was pretty funny. But it, it kind of I kind of it kind of works. I think it worked. <laughs> I think you you played the um the nerdy role very well, but by the end of the story it's like you've both come into your own and you realize that like you don't need this potion to be confident in yourself so i think you played that like character progression really well whether you were intending to or not no yeah yeah that was definitely um you know when we worked on the script uh, early on we you know i definitely we all saw this sort of very clear arc and it was sort of well written you know we mm-hmm. could just like oh okay so we, i'm at this point of the arc and and while we were making it you know cuz you shoot it out of order 
um, you know, Dale, we, we would go over, okay, so he's here, right? Okay, right, yeah, let's do that, you know. Right, let's let's yeah. let's get the hair more like Hercules. Yeah, exactly, it was all about the hair. Yeah, yeah. by the end of the movie, it's like you, you started with Flowing it like locks. combed flat, and by the yeah. end, it's the bouncy <laughs> curls. Yeah, yeah. And fantastic, yeah. And another same, with, one of same your, with Sandy. Mm-hmm. Another one of your fa- favorite movies, CG, Hercules. But we don't have time to get into that. But also, I forgot to say... Um, how fun was it catching up with Misha in South Carolina? Oh my God, that was so much fun. I loved it. It was so great. And I was, I was so happy that that ended up, um, yeah, we went out to dinner. It was a fantastic time. And then, and then she came on your show. Mm-hmm. I, I was just so, it was so great. I mean, uh, your show was so, um, it was so fun. I, I listened to almost all of them. Oh, really? And it was, yeah, yeah, because, um, uh, you know, I just found it very, um, you know, I, this kind of sounds kind of funny, but it, it was very healing, you know, like, you know, I got, you know, I got written off the show and although I, I got to direct and I was very, you know, um, it was just really, uh, you know, I didn't have the best feelings about, you know, everybody and, you know, uh, I just felt like listening to everybody's point of view and especially um, Adam Brody's two episodes, they were fantastic. Um, and But, you know, listening to the editors and Norman and, you know, it, I, it was just great. And, and of course, you know, Josh, it was just, it was just such a wonderful, it was just great to hear everybody again. And it just made me feel so, I, I'm so glad that you guys did that podcast oh, you know what you're not the first first of all the first person who said that to me was josh he said it was like therapy because i'm sure yeah because we all had we were all so invested and had different experiences like you said and like alan heinberg said he would drive around la listening and um yeah. you know and people from the show really did very similar things to what you just told me and that to me is a true reward and i would love to to continue to go deeper and and interview people that we've already interviewed, but do the same thing like we're doing with you, talking about other work as well. Because um, I got so much spiritually, really, for my soul doing this and connecting and yeah. talking to people. Yeah, I bet. I bet you did. Yeah, yeah I did too. Yeah. yeah. It was really great. No, and great. I'm glad yeah, Misha came on that. as well, you know, um, because yeah. we all know that everybody has a different experience, but she was, she was really, uh, it was very wonderful that she came on and she really did it for the fans. We're doing this for people that love that show and they were really, and, and it really had such an impact on their life. And, um, I'd love to interview her more about other things. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, oh, and there's another thing because I did do, I listened to an interview with you with Brian Baumgartner and you talked about your first tone meeting directing for the OC and that people were talking about that. Tell me about that, that they, they were like, okay, in this scene, this actor might do this and this scene, this actor might. Oh my God. I've never heard of that. Oh, it's incredible. It's like, it's sort of like being a kid and listening to your parents talk totally honestly about the kids in the family you know like you're like holy shit they know that or <laughs> they they feel that way about that kid like yeah so oh, no. so i sat in my first tone meeting and they were just like well listen uh blah 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 won't know their lines but uh so we're, we're trying to push her to that because you know eventually she's going to be killed so you know or whatever you know it's just <laughs> you're just like wait what <laughs> you know like you're thinking of this it's like yeah it's not till two seasons from now but you know and, and um they didn't say it was, that early uh, did they well, no, no, I shouldn't have used killing. Her, but, <laughs> I was but, like, what? Yeah, that was, you know, that was, uh, like, that, you that made was my sign. No. You had to no, sign an NDA or something. No, you're, you're should, making that up. <laughs> I'm making that up. That, uh, that part, I mean, for, for the OC, I'm making that up. But in other tone meetings, oh, you know, I see. where the, the, they, you know, every, every show has a tone meeting. So, um, uh, you know, you get this insight to the actors and how they mm. work and, uh, their work ethic and what they want to do and what they're going to fight you on and what they're not going to fight you on. And, um, I mean, they just, they just know the actors like their own children really? and they know what, uh, is going to happen in the scene and they know what's going to push their buttons and what's not. And, um, it, it's, it's amazing but- how, 
ton of meetings. But there's got to be some actors who are like, we don't even worry about that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you. Okay. You were one of those. I was like, I hope, because I feel like oh, I... Oh, no. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> all the adults, all the adults, they were totally like, oh, yeah. Yeah. You, Peter, Kelly. No, they didn't care about you yeah. at all. I mean, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, Mindy, this is great. You know, Mindy's going to love this. She's going to tear this up. She's going to eat it up, you know, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, so there'd be good things and then there'd be, you know, like not such good things. Well, yeah. but th- that's, there's something to be said for actors bring amazing, wonderful things, but, and that's, but at the same time, you know, the, those, everyone has a different process. So however, but they, yeah. they learn to adjust. So I thought that was an interesting thing because I haven't been on that, that side. So when you said that, I was like, Oh, I have to ask him about that. You should. You should <laughs> get on that side. I You'd will, love it. I'm You'd be so good at it. You'd be so good at it. We have kept you so long. I know. I'm sorry. I've kept you guys. No, oh, right. no, 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 no. I'm sure. Like, well, This is our first. This is our virgin uh, maiden. <laughs> okay, good. Maiden <laughs> voyage. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, well, it was really fun to hear what CG had to say. You know, I really did. Because I'm so curious about, like how young people see all these old movies. I think it's a really great idea for a podcast. And, and CG, you're, you're so important. Like, <laughs> like, I mean, that's why I wanted to do this. I mean, as much as I love talking to your mom. Um, <laughs> but to get your perspective is something that people want to know, want to hear. Yeah, I'm excited. I think, I think it's a big topic right now. Like people in my generation, my age, going back and looking at these things and, you know, accepting them for what they were, but also understanding, you know, where it went wrong and stuff and how times are different. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. How times are different. Mm -hmm. I got excited too. I was like, oh, we're going to watch. I, you know, I started thinking about like Porky's and these movies that I was talking about. And then I got a little afraid of like of doing it because I, because yeah. I'm used to celebrating what I'm what I'm talking about because I remember seeing movies when I was young and seeing people laugh and all that and it's okay to say this is what happened then now I'm going to rewatch and see it's it's a comment on society to see what our reactions are in in today's yeah. world you know so how we've evolved yeah if you have any suggestions of what she th- should should listen to or watch let, let text me because we're, we're, we're also getting, we want to be interactive with the audience and watch things that they want us to watch. So uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. there's so many, like, um, you know, like even, even, even like my cousin Vinny and ruthless people and dirty, dirty rotten scoundrels from this same yeah, writer. I would go, you know. I would go my cousin Vinny of all of those yeah. is the best Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, Marissa Tomei is fucking great. And, you know, she won an Oscar for that. Yeah. Right. Um, but even, yeah, that's but, a, that's a really good one. I mean, I'd love to take CG back to, I mean, we're going to stick to, to some, we're going to also watch some of her favorites as well, but I'd love to take her back to some of these amazing films that were produced by Paramount in the seventies, you know, and Robert Evans, you know, the Pacino movies oh, well, yeah, and, and Dog 70s, Day Afternoon yeah, and, yeah. and all those things. That was like the, yeah, the, Godfathers. So Godfathers. You know, I've for, never for one, seen the one, Godfather. One, oh. Oh, really? Oh, oh, you're in for a treat. Or I've, you're in I've for seen a treat. parts of it. It's like I've walked in on people watching it, and but I know I've never seen it all the way through. I've never seen the Titanic all the way through. Oh, oh, oh that's a good one. Okay. With, um, nice. Well, I forget his Billy name. Zane. Billy Zane. Billy Zane. Billy Zane. Yeah. 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 I have yeah. to, I always, the other thing is I'm kind of going through my list of asking people that I've worked with or know. So, um, I, I always think like, I don't think I know anybody in the Titanic, but you can always ask. Anyway, uh, Tate Donovan, we love you so much. Yay. We can, you can <laughs> follow see you guys. Tate on, I think it's T, what is it on Instagram? Oh, T8 Dono. T, T the number eight. And D-O-N-O. D-O-N-O. Yeah. And watch, check him out on Apple TV on Ghosted. Anything else coming up? Um, yeah, I'm in a movie with um, Paul Giamatti called um, The Leftovers. I think it'll be out in the fall or maybe uh, the winter of uh, this year. But it's a it's a oh, it's a great script. I have a tiny part in it, but um, it's such a good script. Really cool. Oh, I Paul love Giamatti. Him. He's he's crazy good. Love him, man. the The world is your oyster, CG, and you got um, a little pearl here today, Mr. Donovan. Um, 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank I you. appreciate it. It was, it was so nice to see you it. again too, it. like 10 yeah, years later. Great to see you too. <laughs> yeah, right? I know. Okay. All right, ciao. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Wow, CG. I think this is a great moment to stop here. <laughs> That was long, it was epic, but it was so fulfilling. That's why I'm doing this. And we're so grateful to Tate for coming on our first episode for our new podcast. I know, and I can't believe how much I liked Love Potion number nine. And really? that he was dating Sandra Bullock by the end of the movie. You learned some new things, huh? You, you didn't even know what a Carmen Ghia was, but now you know. The coolest now I know. car. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty crazy. So listeners, if you loved Tate breaking down Love Potion number nine, please head on over to our Patreon for more exclusive bonus content and more interview with Tate Donovan. That is right. We have some really juicy content on the Patreon. We have some iconic guests lined up for the, um, well, from shows. Look, look. We're going to do a little mini Vampire Diaries watch because it's your favorite, right? It's my beyond favorite. (laughs) Yes. um, We're going to look at a movie called A Walk to Remember. Hopefully Shane West will join us. Maybe Peter Gallagher will help us with Sex, Lies, and Videotape. We would love to hear what you listeners think we should rewatch. We want your input or watch for the first time as well. You can message us on our Patreon or Discord or at IG. Uh, I am at the Melinda Clark and CG is at CG Mirror. And we also have TikToks. I'm the same at the Melinda Clark and CG is at CG Mirror on TikTok. We will also be taking suggestions and cannot wait to continue this rewatch journey. <laughs> I am so excited to keep watching some of these films that you're going to be introducing me to, as well as some of my favorite. So thank you everyone so much for listening. Please follow, rate, and review us wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to watch your podcast, check us out on YouTube. And don't forget to sign up for our Patreon. It would really be a mistake not to check it out. It's going to be fun. I can't wait, really, truly, to connect with the listeners and supporters that we've had and we've built over the past couple years. We're really doing this for you guys. And um, I can't wait to have conversations and do live events and really help this community grow and, you know, give back everything you've given to us. Bye, bitches.